right. Uh, good afternoon. Can you guys uh, see us? All good. And hear me too, hopefully. Oh, great. So, any cases or uh, issues that you guys uh, uh, want to discuss or uh, come up with you? Hi, Linda. I had a funny thing today. Uh, I had a, uh, you know, for the infection control people, at, uh, I won't say what hospital, but they did, uh, we got tested for uh, 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 TB, you know, the TB mask, make sure the N95 works. And they tested us. I said, this is funny. Why are we, they tested us on a mask that wasn't even in the hospital. So it was, uh, I just thought it was, it was funny. But <laughs> <laughs> I said, this is not the one we use. And so, uh, you know, each mask is very different. I was just, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Uh, anyways, anyways, I want to talk today about C. diff colitis. You know, we've all dealt with C. diff colitis for the last few years, particularly. Uh, but there's a more virulent strain. C. diff has become uh, like into a super bug. And it's really, uh, if you work in a hospital a lot, like we do, we see a lot of very sick people and a lot of people getting severe morbidity and mortality from this disease. It's really changed and become a very nasty bug. And that's what I want to inform you guys what's going on. It's really much more virulent than ever. And so this is just to uh, summarize uh, what uh, about pseudomembranous colitis. That, I'll show you why they call it pseudomembranous in a second, but basically C. difficile colitis. Uh, the, the morbidity and mortality weekly report from the CDC says that death, I, um, uh, this one was not uh, death, uh, excess health care is now reaching a billion dollars. Uh, spent uh, every year on uh, anything. You know, a logician never can. All right. So a billion dollars here and a billion dollars there, there it starts to add up. And what's gone over the last uh, decade in C. diff is that there are now about 500,000 infections a year of C. diff, which is three times what it was uh, a decade ago. And the number of deaths from C. diff in the hospital. Uh, is about 29,000 deaths per year, which is probably about twice as many people who die from MRSA. You know, traditionally we think of MRSA as the real worst pathogen or healthcare-associated infection, but C. diff is really uh, blown it out of the water. And we're going to go over some of the causes of why is it gone so bad. Probably number one is, and why we have antibiotic stewardship programs, is that the overuse of antibiotics has let C. diff really take off. But there's two other major reasons. One is this new virulent C. diff strain I'm going to talk about today. It is a nasty bug. It's really a super C. diff, and it's associated with much greater mortality uh, and morbidity in, in the patients. And because of this uh, nasty strain, relapses has also gone up. So we have overuse of antibiotics, a much more virulent C. diff causing more disease, and more relapses, and that's contributed uh, to this three-time uh, increase over uh, the last decade. So half a million cases a year of C. diff. All right, so just a little background that we're going into more detail. C. diff is a bacteria. It forms spores. Uh, so those spores are inactive spores, but they can, because they're spores, you know, they're not active uh, chemically at all, so they can exist everywhere on uh, people's hands, on the bed rails uh, for weeks at a time. Uh, and it causes a whole spectrum of infection disease from asymptomatic uh, uh, stool carrier to fulminant uh, uh, toxic pentacolon and death. And uh, the big thing that we're going to emphasize today is fecal oral transmission uh, through contaminated bed so bedside, man uh, bedside rails, beds, and on the hands of healthcare personnel. And uh, this is why we're it's really taken off in the, uh, in the hospital. And the reason we, you get it is uh, it gets activated when you wipe out the healthy bacterial flora uh, by taking antibiotics. So let's just go over the spectrum of C. diff infection. Most people don't realize that uh, there are carriers. There's a lot of people who have just carried the C. diff. They call it asymptomatic carriage. It's in their stool. It's not active. It's just a spore form. Uh, they don't have diarrhea associated with it, but they are contagious to other people. And it goes from that to just mild diarrhea, to severe diarrhea with what we call the pseudomembranes, and then it can end up uh, at the 
part of the spectrum, really this severe toxic megacolon where the colon can rupture and uh, multi-organ failure and death can occur. So it's a whole spectrum of acetic infection that we see. And so it's called the two-hit uh, a, a two hit hypothesis of how people get sick. So the first uh, mistake is you get hospitalized. You first have to get into the hospital to be exposed to C. diff. Okay, you, you're in the hospital for whatever reason. Uh, oops, sorry. And then about you get exposed to the C. diff spores in the hospital. About every week in the hospital increases your risk of getting colonized with C. diff about 10%. So average person spending a week in a hospital has about 10% chance of getting uh, infected with the spores. But once you get infected with the spores, you don't get disease. You really need the second part of the, of the arm, which is being exposed to antibiotics. And so, as I'll show you that the C. diff uh, spores are controlled by the healthy bacteria. You know, there's trillions of bacteria in our body. They're very crowded in there. And they're not going to make room for this uh, this uh, pathogen, and it just keeps it at bay. But once you wipe out that gut flora, you know the whole stage is to the to the C diff has it to itself and takes over. So you need first to be hospitalized and get C diff, and then you need to be exposed to the antibiotics. So on the mild side of it, you can be you can be uh, colonized with the C diff. Uh, you may have been a healthcare worker who's taking antibiotics. You may uh, your body uh, may be able to control it, but you're, you're colonized. And people who are colonized do not have diarrhea. Uh, but it's, while they're not in cotton of stool, it's, most of the time it's on their hands. Okay, so 60% of people who carry it, who have asymptomatic C. diff carriage, see those are spores you see down there, those spores are on their hands. And so if they don't wash their hands and they touch the side rail of the, uh, of the bed, they have it on their stethoscope, they touch the patient, uh, that patient uh, then can get colonized with C. diff. So it's not just the hands, it's, uh, the, it's the inanimate stuff, the stethoscopes, the bedpans, the side rails, that, those spores, those spores are very hardy, they don't die, okay? They, they're very, they're inactive, and they're just waiting to be exposed to people. So non-poopers are important sources of potential infection to others. You really need to wash with soap and water. Alcohol, uh, a hand rub does not get rid of the spores, okay? But soap and water, the agitation of washing your hands gets them off it. So non-poopers among healthcare workers who are not using gloves, not washing their hands, are very important cause of transmission of uh, the first part of the, uh, the disease process, which is getting colonization. And so you get the C. diff, you acquire it, you get exposed to antibiotics, and then you go from either asymptomatic carrier to this whole range of uh, disease. Uh, and uh, so this, 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 is what, this sort of reviews what happens. So if you look on the top there, the, you see the stomach, you see two things. One is the blue spores, and the second are those green, the vegetative cells. The vegetative cells are the active form. The spore will, will germinate and become a vegetative form. But in a normal person, and when it starts passing through the stomach, acid kills those uh, vegetative, vegetative spores. So it, it basically protects the rest of the intestines. And so one of the interesting things is that uh, the overuse of like H2 blockers like protonics and meprazole, uh, which neutralize the uh, stomach acid. So if somebody uh, has, is on those medicines, they, they get exposed to C. diff, instead of their stomach sterilizing, uh, the, the, vegetative, the, the vegetative forms, it uh, passes right through. So that's a risk factor, not just antibiotics, but being on H2 blockers, any acid blockers, increase the risk. It then I mean, then it, it starts passing down through the colon, you can see up there, uh, the spores become the vegetative forms, and then it gets to the colon. So the colon has trillions of healthy bacteria, and these spores are not able, and these vegetative forms are not able to set up shop. They're just they said there's no room in the end, get out. But once you wipe out that healthy bacteria with using broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, the spores go crazy. You know, they got this whole open gym, there's nothing there on the stage. They start producing toxins, these toxins are called A and B. These toxins are very toxic to the, you see those cells, those calmer cells, that's the lining of the, of the colon. They, they cause inflammation and they kill the lining of the cells. 
And so what happens is that this whole mucosal winding cell lifts up, it's dead, and it causes, it looks like, when you look at it, it looks like a membrane. So they call these pseudomembranes. So if you see somebody, you know, they've been exposed to C. diff, they've either got antibiotics or H2 blockers, these, the, the spores, the inactive form, uh, become, convert to the, the vegetative form. They start producing the toxins in the colon. There's no other bacteria to inhibit their growth. They attack the lining of the intestines. The whole lining of the intestines uh, lifts up. And you get these pseudomembranes. So it looks like membranes, but this is just dead lining of the intestine, the whole colon. So if you do a colonoscopy, you'll see these, these big, white, and uh, greenish patches. And that's just the lining of the intestine totally been destroyed and left it off. So that's how they call it C. difficile colitis or pseudomembranous colitis. Okay, so why are we seeing this amazing increase from a uh, three-fold increase in C. diff incidence in the last 10 years and so much death? It's really a perfect storm. One is that, uh, we're gonna talk, the next slide will show this thing called the NAP1 strain. These strains have lost all control. They, they have a genetic mutation which uh, allows them to produce 10, 20, 30 times more toxin than the normal strain. So these, this, this C. diff producing amazing amounts of, of poisonous toxins just overwhelms any ability to control it. Two, the C. diff used to be controlled with the antibiotics. You know, you take an antibiotic, a, you know, a, a, a zealous or something like that, that would kill the C. diff in the past. But the C. diff has now developed resistance, which means it's not affected by the antibiotics that we use, particularly the quinolones. So suddenly, we're using ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin for the last 15 years, like you know, like it's like it's water. It's wiping out all the healthy bacteria. It's clearing out that uh, healthy uh, microbiome, and the C. diff just shines it off and has a, has a stage to itself. So resistance to the antibiotics that used to inhibit it, increasing virulence, and we have an older population: cancer patients, chemo patients. Uh, old patients, dialysis patients, that are much more susceptible whose immune systems can't control it. And probably on top of that, the move from soap to alcohol. Soap, washing your hands, that, that just the agitation of washing your hands gets rid of the spores. Alcohol doesn't touch those spores. Okay, so we mean well by using alcohol, but we're not, we're not uh, blocking the transmission. So this was, this is when people started appreciating this new, this new uh, antibiotic resistant toxin producing C. diff, which is called the NAP1 strain. This was in Pittsburgh around 2000. This was also replicated in Quebec and a few other places, but they said, whoa, what's going on here? So you can see, uh, this was in the uh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, every year, like one was blue, would be colectomies and then deaths in C. diff. It was going about five to ten cases. Then all of a sudden in 2000, they had an amazing number of colectomies to try to save these people's lives and death. So they started noting this thing, and they, they, they identified this strain called the NAP1 strain. And they said, maybe it's because this NAP1 strain is not, is, is resistant to vancomycin and plasma, the drugs we use. But when they studied it in the lab, this is the C diff, telling us whether or not the antibiotic works against it or not. If it's green, as you see on this flagell, works and vancomycin works. So these C diff strains were not resistant to the antibiotics we were using. It's just that they were producing so much toxin, it's totally, they were so toxic, it just overwhelmed the, the traditional treatments. So it wasn't because plasma or vanco wasn't working, it was just that the toxin was overwhelming the, uh, the immune system. And on the other side, levofloxacin, which is like the same as cyclofloxacin, uh, and clindamycin, they're all red, which means that the, the, the C. diff was no longer being killed by the, uh, by the antibiotics we're using left and right. So we have, at, we're using Cipro, Levoquin, Moxifoxin, all these uh, quinolones, and they were not touching the C. diff. The C. diff was totally resistant to it. So that you use these antibiotics, you wipe out the gut flora, the C. diff uh, would take over, start producing overwhelming amounts of toxin, and uh, people were dying from it. So this is called the NAP1 strain. Uh, this is the strain of C. diff which produces overwhelming amounts of toxin. It's, uh, it, it's now seen in Nevada. It wasn't seen in Nevada until about three to four years ago, but approximately one third of all cases in Nevada are now at that point positive. If you have a very sick patient with C. diff, you can almost guarantee it's one of these toxic nap one strains. So it's resistant to the antibiotics we overuse in the hospital, particularly the quinolones. It has a genetic mutation that allows it to produce 10 to 20 times more of that A and B toxin to be secreted. So just 
is like bombarding the system with toxin. And so these patients uh, are much more likely to progress to fulminant disease and death. And not only that, they go from the spore form to the germ, uh, they germinate to the vegetative spore much easier. So they're much more likely to become active, much more likely to produce toxins, much more likely to kill the patient. And what's interesting is that uh, we've moved over to using PCR testing to diagnose C. diff. And the, uh, your PCR test, if you do a PCR test, uh, uh, they will find out, they will tell you whether it's not a NAC1 positive. They do it, part of the test is to find it. It's not FDA approved to tell you that, so they don't report it, but if you call them, they will tell you whether it's a NAC1 strain. And so, one third of all cases in Nevada, and it's, you know, we almost always get, this guy is so sick, it's gotta be this, this horrible strain. And so, the way you diagnose C. diff, you don't want to culture it because not all C. diff produce uh, the toxin. There's some uh, benign C. diff, they don't produce toxin. And, you know, you can culture it, it takes a few days. The traditional way of doing it is an ELISA test, which basically looks for the toxin, and it's a pretty quick test. But that will miss about a third of all cases. The test that most people are moving now, even smaller hospitals, is the it's a PCR test. It's done on a simple machine. Uh, the hospitals here in Reno uh, and Reno are all doing it. Uh, it basically identifies whether or not the C diff uh, toxin gene is present. So you may have you may have a C diff, but doesn't produce that toxin gene. This will identify all all C diff that has the potential to produce C diff. But you could be a carrier and, and have it, so this test will be positive. You don't want to order this test unless they have watery diarrhea, okay? So it's almost too sensitive because you could have a CDF PCR producing, a CDR PCR positive, but, uh, but it's not producing the toxin. So you always want to check watery diarrhea. And so this is that whole, what I'm talking about. This is the human microbiome, you know, it's one of the things and probably the biggest research area in medicine is how healthy uh, how most 99.99% of all the bacteria in our body are healthy and keeping us healthy and protecting us. So this is the Human Microbiome Project says the human body has 100 trillion microscopic life forms living in it. You call this living. So you can imagine that your intestines, you know, you got so many crowded bacteria, and they're not going to make room for this C. diff guy, you know, this outsider to come in and take over. But once you wipe out all this healthy bacteria, the C. diff just goes crazy. And so you not only have to be exposed to C. diff, but you have to take antibiotics. And so you can also, why don't we see much C. diff in the community? It's because we give antibiotics, but they're probably not exposed to the, to the, the C. diff. So it's, this is really a hospital problem where, where, you're, where the patients are unwittingly been exposed to C. diff from the doctors, the nurses, or the environment. In the community, it's very rare to see C. diff, even though we're giving them antibiotics. All right, it's because you've got this healthy bacteria, you haven't wiped it out. Right. And so this all leads to, you may have heard about uh, stool transplants, and this, uh, this was the, the original article, and what they did was basically, these were patients who relapsed, you know, they were treated with vancor or plagio, but they keep on coming back, and they basically, they, stuck a, they took a tube and stuck it uh, into their uh, intestines, and they infused them with healthy feces, you know, that sounds like oxymoron, they made sure they didn't have any nasty salmonella or HIV and things like that. And they basically replace that. What they're doing is they're basically infusing them with healthy bacteria to take over the intestines and uh, block the C. diff. And what they found out was on the right side where it says vancomycin, so these were patients who had recurrent C. diff. Only 30% of the patients who had recurrent disease were getting treated with the vancomycin. Only 30% of them were cured. But if they gave a... Uh, an infusion of donor feces, they had 81% cure rate, and they gave them a second one because they, because they didn't do it, they got a 94% cure rate. So it makes sense, you know, it's just, uh, you got to keep that healthy bacteria. And so some of the newer developments I was going to talk about, uh, there's, a, there's a fun thing, if you, if you Google uh, Cliff the C. diff dog, he's a, he's a beagle in uh, Holland, and uh, Dogs have 300 times more sensitive nose, and they, it's a cute little beetle, and uh, they train to identify C. diff. And he goes around and he smells the patients, and, and he, he lays down in front of the bed uh, if they have C. diff. And he's almost a perfect diagnostic test. They're also looking at doing it with rats and stuff, but they think patients would rather have a beetle than a rat, you know. <laughs> but it's a really remarkable. There are some work looking at ticocycline uh, being an additional antibiotic. 
which may have activity against a fulmin C diff. They're trying to make uh, stool transfer more palatable, and the guy on the right there has put stool into uh, gelatin capsules and make it easier for people to swallow more and less invasive procedure putting tubes down. So uh, Jelly Belly is going to come up with a diarrhea flavor gelatin capsule. But uh, this is what's really interesting, you know, uh, if you had a, a fulminant case of C. diff, you know, oftentimes these patients are older, debilitated, and the only way to save their life is to do a colectomy. You actually, you go in there, take out the whole colon, and you know, uh, you know, who wants to, you know, have their whole colon removed, their older patients, it's really very difficult, and the decision oftentimes delays so much, the patient dies anywhere, anyways. And so, this picture on the left was at the VA hospital, one of the surgical residents took a picture of the, of the colon. So what's that white, that green stuff you see, those are the pseudomembranes uh, from that patient. So that patient lived, but he had to go total colectomy. So what's pretty cool is that uh, they have a much more, because what you want to do is you want to get the vancomycin down into the, into the colon, and if you have a mega colon, you're not going to be able to orally get it down, so they take out the colon, save their lives. But they have this new procedure it's called a, a loop ileostomy. So when they get to the ilium, which is right before the colon, traditionally you'll have it, you know, if you, if you uh, what they do is they will bend, uh, they'll cut up a, a slice in the end of the ilium, and at one end where the stool comes out from the small intestines, they'll put a, uh, an ostomy bag. But the other end, which goes into the colon, uh, they will stick a tube and what they'll do is, it's, very, it's a very small incision, you just open it up a little ostomy bag or the other, and then you put like a little foley or a tube, and you can then flush vancomycin right into the colon, 500 cc's of vancomycin, then you have the nurse sort of rotate the patient around and uh, uh, coat the colon. So this is a, a it's called a double barreled ileostomy, it preserves the colon, much lower mortality, and I, have, I see I have my friends here from northern Nevada, they had a lady who uh, came in about two weeks ago. Her white count was 50,000. By the following morning, she was in multi-organ failure, intubated. Her white count was 109,000. And uh, uh, the surgeon there, Dr. Murray, went ahead and did this double barrel ileostomy. It was just a small little incision. Uh, we infused the vancomycin. The nurse shook her around. And uh, she pulled through, and she, she went home just a few days ago. It was just remarkable. She was also on ticlocycline, so she, uh, you know, any other place they would take another colon, and so this was, you know, a, instead of dragging your feet, say, oh, do we do the colectomy, this is something that could be done earlier, and they've had a few studies other places reduce the mortality from 80% down to 20%, and this is a very easily reversible procedure, so this is pretty exciting if we get uh, the surgeons and everybody to buy into this, just a simple double barrel ileostomy. All right. Now, in case you were sleeping, this is test time. We'll go over some, uh, some questions just to review what we talked about. All right. You guys, answer in your heads, which fact is incorrect about C. diff? Uh, causes half a million cases per year. True or false? Right. Uh, severity of the illness has increased the last few years. Right. The majority of C. diff cases are community acquired. So, right. You just don't, you do see C. diff, but it's very unusual. Unless somebody's in and out of the hospital. If they're in and out of the hospital, that'd be healthcare associated. But a pure community acquired, it's very unusual just because very few people are carriers of C. diff. And relapses are a major problem with C. diff and may respond to stool transplant. Right, we just saw that. That's an excellent use of, of, a, of a transplant, okay? Because you just, you, you give them a whole, healthy bio, uh, microbiome. So which of the following is incorrect regarding medical management of C. diff? We could go into all this, but uh, let's we'll just talk about oral flagell is recommended for mild C. diff. Yeah, so if somebody's mild, which means they're not very sick, just a little watery diarrhea, their white count's not high, they're taking fluids, you can start off with flagell. But almost anybody sick enough to be hospitalized has moderate to severe defined by worsening renal function and higher white counts. We usually do oral vancomycin. Uh, and then, so, uh, patients with fulminant C. diff with ileus, so it means they're not, their colon's not working at all, should receive intravenous vancomycin. True or false? 
Yeah, you got to talk about it. But vancomycin IV does not get into the colon. You have to give it orally. And so that's why that procedure with the double ileostomy, if they have that fulminant C. diff, they have a megacolon, you can actually wash it through that little tube into the intestines and, and uh, coat through intestines. So intravenous vanco does not work at all. Okay. Manifestations of fulminant C. diff include all the following. Severe abdominal pain and worsening diarrhea. Yes. These patients are extremely sick. Hypotension requiring vasopressors. Yes. These people are amazingly sick. They'll be, on, they'll be in the ICU. Uh, dropping white counts. False. That's, there's something weird. If you ever see a high white count uh, and it's not leukemia, always think C. diff. You will see white counts 35, 50, I told you 109,000. And we've seen a number of 90, 100,000. 109 is my record. So uh, it says something about C. diff that makes people have extremely high white, white counts. So respiratory failure requiring intubation. Yes. Okay. Elevated lactic levels, renal failure. So these people are extremely sick. The lady I just told you about, she had all that stuff. She was intubated, hypotensive, diarrhea, and renal failure. And the white count, the highest ever seen. All right. So this is really what's important today. Increased virulence of the NAP1 strain as a result of which the following. Lower rates of germination, true or false. The spores are much more likely to get active. Okay, so that's why this disease is nastier. So it has a higher rates of going from the spore to the vegetative, uh, the veg the vegetative form. So that means the spore is activated. So much more likely to become active, much more likely to recur, uh, recur uh, episodes. Higher resistance to antifungal agents. Oh. False, yes. Yeah. Antibiotics. And we talk again, particularly the quinolones and some of the cephalosporins. So, uh, you know, Cipro, you try to avoid using the quinolones if you can, particularly somewhere in the hospital, just because uh, an older patient it has a lot of issues and it's going to put some increased risk for C. diff. Uh, so, higher resistance to antibiotics, not antifungals. A gene mutation leading to reduce toxin reduction. True or false? False. Right. It's got a mutation that makes it go crazy. There's no feedback mechanism. It just produces as much toxin as it can and overwhelms any treatment you give it. Uh, ability to produce large amounts of toxin A and B that overwhelm the treatment attempts. All right, true. All right, so this is not much strain. This isn't antibiotics. Produces more toxins uh, and much more virulent. And you can, as I said, if you have the PCR machine, they won't report it. You just call down there and they'll confirm it, okay? So last question, new approaches to C. diff infection include all the following except uh, PCR testing for quicker, more sensitive diagnosis. True or false? True, yeah, so it's, it picks up very quickly. Stool transplant for recurrent disease. Right. Less invasive surgical techniques to improve outcome and allow for earlier intervention. Right. I say it was, it was just remarkable with that case we saw, just completely how well she did. And there's a drug called fedoxamycin. I think it's called, what's it called? Fedoxamycin. Don't let the brand name. Deficit? Yeah. Deficit. Fedoxamycin, we didn't talk about, it's this, uh, fedoxamycin has an inexpensive and effective oral therapy for that one strain infections. False. Fedoxamycin is this drug that was, it was safer, it was easier than vancomycin to take, and it reduced relapse rate, but it cost $3,000 versus about 10, 10 bucks for oral vancomycin. And it doesn't work against an that one strain where you really need it. So, but it works against it. It's just not any better than anything else. So yeah. I mean, it, it, it didn't, didn't offer anything. It didn't offer anything over there. Yes, except it cost 300 times as much as vancomycin. So forget it. All right. So watch for C. diff. And you know, as infection control people, uh, people need to use soap and water and uh, just uh, you know respect their patients, not spreading this disease around. Try to avoid uh, overuse of antibiotics, particularly the quinolones. And uh, if somebody's extremely sick uh, and you have a surgeon uh, involved, maybe talk about this procedure. And the other thing I'd add is don't try and use metronidazole on that yeah. one strain. Yeah. You know, we had a plagio, it's a very weak drug. It's called a mother in law drug, right? Yeah, this IV physician wrote this editorial saying, 
uh, flagell that's good enough for your mother-in-law, but is it good enough for your mother? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, that, so that's why I gave it to my mother-in-law. <laughs> All right, so be aggressive about these patients and just do your uh, infection controls as good as, you, as good as you can. And get PCR testing for quick, more sensitive Any comments about you guys? Do you see them in some of the smaller facilities or? I have a question. It seems I'm trying to research how long to keep a patient on isolation since the spores can be shed for so long after the infection. It seems like the most recent information I found is either for the duration of illness and 48 hours past um, the last diarrhea. Um, so is that still in your case, in your opinion? Are you here, Beth? Yeah, that's, that's a funny question. Uh, Beth, is Beth here? Beth still there? Uh, you know, it would seem. Beth is here. It would seem like you'd want to keep them during the hospitalization, but the, I think the, the CDC's latest recommendations is three days of no diarrhea. Four days. Uh, two days. Two Four days. hours. But yeah. the problem is, if you take them out of isolation, that doesn't mean there aren't spores all over the room. Yes. Um, so theoretically, by CDC, you can take them out of isolation, but anybody that goes in there better have gloves and gowns because they can pick, you can pick it up by just touching against the bed post. Yeah, they, they pass spores for weeks, or if not even longer, yeah. It just because they have diarrhea, they don't have diarrhea, you know it's there. And it's there because the patient was sick there for two days, so. But the recommendation is two days. How long do the spores survive? No. Well, spores are spores, you know, spores can hang around for six months. Forever. Yeah. Really That's why you gotta do that 10% bleach business to really get everything down. Yeah, so they both have people, if you get into, if you get a major room, Person before you have C diff, your risk of getting C diff is twice uh, if you did. So if you get hospitalized, bring, make sure you bring your own bleach wipes uh, and clean your room. Um, one thing to add, you know, you mentioned we don't see much from the community, but we're seeing a lot, actually seeing a lot more from the community. But when they actually did the research to find out why, it all comes tracing back. So maybe a relative. Your your mother had C diff comes back to the house, gets spores in the house, and you who have been in the hospital pick up those spores and start an antibiotics and then bam, you're, and you're and you, you have no relationship to a hospital. But when they really traced everything back, there is a relationship. That's part of the mother-in-law. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the mother-in-law <laughs> that we didn't treat right the first time. <laughs> all right, so thank you all. Um, actually, I have one more question for you, too. So for the fecal transplant, I wanted to consider starting a program like that at our hospital. So what would be your recommended steps as far as getting something like that started? You know, that's a big thing because you got to go through IRB and stuff like that. Uh, there is a place, a uh, nonprofit, and uh, like, uh, I forgot the name of the organization, but they will send you the stool and everything. Uh, so you just basically need a motivated gastroenterologist to do it. But there's a... These, all these very dedicated people, they've set up this thing and they're like a bank and they will send you the process stool that's all clean and ready to go and comes in a little packet. Uh, it's, a, it's an organization, uh, I've got the name of it. But I think the FDA has first said you have to get IRB approval and said not. So it's, it's uh, I know Renown has spent a lot of time and they have a program growing, going for it. But I, I can't tell you the details of doing it. It won't be long before these these compressed tablets and capsules are available. Yeah, yeah. they're they're right here. We just you can get you can actually apparently get these, but I don't know the process of doing. Yeah, it. so it's that organization. It just if you look at nonprofit uh, CGIF uh, organization, it comes up and there's all these young people who are very motivated, dedicated their lives to this project. Right. So if you do have a CDF case that's real sick, and you just give us a call anytime and we can give you some advice on how to handle it. We have a question. Yes. I um, we're debating on whether or not you should use lactobacillus or saccharomyces when a, they have a positive C. diff. I don't you know. It seems, like it, it seems like it makes sense, but you know, if you look at that microbiome, that is an amazing thing that's taken billions of years for bacteria to develop relationships. There's hundreds of species, and, and it seems sort of simplistic just to give one bacteria to somehow that's going to 
you know, replace everything. There's, there's too much going on, and there's the evidence that it works is it, it seems like too simplistic. You know, I eat yogurt, you're not going to get anything. And we had we had a case a few years ago. We had a patient with C. diff. We gave him lactobacillus, and he started having fever afterward. And because of his colitis, the lactobacillus got to his blood, so he had lactobacillus bacteremia. And so it was a little iatrogenic. But uh, well, first of all, you never give it during an acute episode yeah. period. Yeah. And then as far as can you give it to prevent? There's, Saccharomyces has been shown to do that. There actually is another one that's been shown to prevent if you give somebody an antibiotic that has had it previously. It's, it's shown to prevent. But just the lactose bacillus that you get, forget about, forget about it. it. Probiotics. Yeah. Probiotics, just, it's just a general term, meaning some type of bacteria. But there, actually, there are certain bacteria that are actually very important in inhibiting C. diff. C. diff. And those lactobacillus that we normally get, there's a combination of three different lactobacillus that seems to do okay. Uh, but not, the, not just the lactobacillus uh, that you, you just pick up and Power. They need this room in about five minutes for the next echo meeting, so we have to say something all right. Please call us if you have any cases you want to discuss. We're always available. Thank you, guys. Adios, amigo. Uh, <laughs> See you, Robert.